Oops. I'm I'm all set now. Hello, uh, my name is Denis, um, and uh, I know a lot about static sites, and that's why I'm here presenting. Um, please note that just because you're not presenting doesn't mean that you don't know a lot about static sites. This would be a wrong application of modus tollens if you assume that P means presenting and K is means knowing a lot about static sites. Then if you're not present, if you don't know a lot about static sites, you can infer from that that you wouldn't be presenting, but not presenting doesn't mean that you wouldn't know a lot. Um, what it basically means is that if you're part of the audience, then um, you're just valid human beings. And uh, uh, after all, a talk doesn't really exist if there's no, if there's no audience. Um, anyway, uh, moving on, uh, I've, been, I've been making st static sites for more than 10 years. Um, and I, I'm primarily, I consider myself a software developer primarily, but I've also done quite a bit of technical writing. Um, and static sites sort of live at this really interesting intersection between static sites and technical writing. Um, I used to work for SoundCloud. Now I work for Movinga as of a couple of days ago. Uh, that's pretty exciting. Uh, but that's not really what I wanted to talk about because I want to talk about something that happened uh, more than 10 years ago. Um, so more than 10 years ago, I wanted to publish my own website and um, I looked at the options out there and there were WordPress and a bunch of other play things and they're all fine, but I, want, I wanted to, I wanted to uh, use a tool that was a bit more advanced, a bit more flexible. And I also didn't want to deal with the security updates. And I wanted to use Ruby because Ruby was my favorite language at the time and it, it, it still is actually uh, 10 years later. And um, I had a virtual server at the time, 10 years ago. I had very limited resources, so I couldn't really run Ruby on that, or I could, it served uh, my content really slowly. Uh, so that was, that was kind of annoying. Um, but then, then I had the idea of writing a script that would generate static HTML and CSS and whatever. And um, I, I made such that script. I called it Nanook and published it on May 3rd, 2007. And that's now 10 years and a half ago. Um, and that piece of software, it's more than 10 years old, but it's still being actively developed. Um, I still love it, I still work on it. And I wanted to give you a, um, oops, a, a demo of what it, what it, how it, how it works. Click here, that's what I did. Uh, Mirror displays, yes. Um, so, no, it's not what I wanted. Uh, so, on the right hand side, you see the Nanook website, which I have running locally. And to the left hand side, uh, that's Visual Studio Code, which is a pretty nice editor. And um, I, uh, we're going to make some changes there. Uh, First of all, um, so I actually want to run bundle exec guard, which will uh, basically listen to any changes that I make and then recompile the site uh, on the fly. So I could say, let's go to the, uh, so this is the website. This is it. This, it's a website. You've seen a website. It's really nothing special about it. Uh, it's, it's uh, how do you say, responsive. Look at that. It looks great on mobile. Um, so what I wanted to do is basically change a little bit of this text. Uh, pretty standard, so I can say, thank you for choosing Nanook, the world's most flexible static site generator. And if I press save, then it will automatically update, which is pretty cool. Um, another thing that Nanook can do, um, I, I realized this is kind of a, a thing that existed out of, or started to exist out of necessity, you can uh, uh, run a bunch of checks so that before you deploy your site, you basically make sure that everything's valid. Um, I'm checking the internal, I'm running the internal links check. So now I know that there will no, be no broken links and no broken images and so on. Uh, what I can do too is I can say, well, that, that site, it, it's great. I want to deploy this. So I have deployment integration, so I can do that. And uh, it would actually fail 
because I intentionally made a typo because there is actually a spell check. It's not built into Nanoc, but uh, like I, I, I built my own one for the Nanoc website. And uh, you spell choosing with to, two to O's, two O's. So now that I've added this, uh, is actually correct. And if I were to deploy now, um, should I deploy it now? Do I, do I want to deploy this thing? I'll just deploy it. And then if you go to the, the actual Nanoc website, no internet. Well, anyway, then it then it crashes really nicely. It's also really beautiful. Um, so yeah, another thing that I wanted to show you about Nanoc that I think is pretty cool is um, there's a file called rules, which basically it has has a gives you a very uh, flexible mechanism for describing how you want to process your your um, your pages, and in particular, what I wanted to uh, show you is, so I have a release notes page. I'm going to zoom out a little bit. Um, so as you can see, like the last release was, uh, what is it, the 21st, like a couple of days ago. And then if you scroll down all the way, 2007. So I have all the release notes on there. Uh, the interesting bit about this is that um, the release notes actually come from the Nanoc package. So the, the thing that's actually installed, so I don't have to copy over release notes. It's the same thing. Um, another thing that you can see is that over here, these are GitHub issue IDs that I could turn into links. And uh, in here, you can actually see how that's done. So I use cram down, which is, which is a markdown implementation. I link GitHub issues. I turn every pass, uh, like I'm, I relativize every pass, so it, there's no absolute pass, which is pretty useful because then you can host it in a subdirectory pretty easily. I do some HTML compression and so on. Um, yeah, so that's kind of what I wanted to show you. Um, one more thing. The touch bar is pretty cool because it has like a button that says like mirror displays and you can mirror and unmirror. It's pretty amazing. Um, but it does not seem to be functioning the way I want it. Okay, so I take that back. It actually isn't working. That's really annoying. Come on. I'm sorry. <laughs> so you go to arrangement and then turn off mirror displays. That also works. And then I can continue. So uh, another thing that Nano can do, so then like website actually also generates or can generate a PDF with uh, LaTeX. Uh, so you can generate a book like a proper book with proper styling with table of contents and index and list of figures and list of tables. And that's kind of kind of what it looks like. It's generated from the from the Nanoc website. It's not perfect because there's there's some there's some things wrong. But I think I picked my screenshots really nicely so you don't actually see that. Ha. Um, so yeah. That is kind of that's 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 Nanoc. That's the tool I've been working on for the past 10 years. Um, so uh, others have started recognizing that the uh, that static sites are actually really uh, quite interesting, and there's for me there's five reasons uh, why um, why uh, static sites are so so so, so nice. Uh, and Felix already talked about this. So they're really fast because any web server is really good at serving static files. It's really easy to deploy. Uh, you don't need um, to install MySQL and PHP and uh, set up MySQL backups because if you host content on MySQL, you also need backups. Uh, I know this from experience because if you forget to do that and your site goes down, then you lose your entire site. This doesn't happen to me anymore. It's pretty safe because there's no code running on the server. It's also really easy to put under version control. So my site has been uh, under in, in Git, actually first Mercurial and before that subversion. So like I, it has a whole history. Um, and so if I wanted to, I could go back in time and build the Nanoc website as it, as it was uh, 10 and a half years ago. I'm not going to do that. It would probably be embarrassing. Um, but yeah. The last thing, you can uh, uh, preview your site really easily. You can build it locally. You don't need to be connected to the internet. Um, and you can also like run checks on it, etc. Uh, pretty cool. Um, so Nanoc isn't just being used by me, it's being used by other sites as well. Um, well, so this is a Nanoc website, so Nanoc is used for the Nanoc website. 
Um, it's also used for, uh, for example, FOSDEM, which is the world's largest free open source conference. Uh, and that site is interesting because it is backed by a uh, conference management system. So all their talks and tracks and rooms and speakers and all the, con the connections between them uh, is sucked into, into Nanook. And then uh, Nanook just spits out, I don't know, thousands of HTML pages. Uh, so that's pretty cool. Uh, GitLab uses Nanook for the documentation. Uh, GitHub uses Nanook for the documentation. And this in particular I find really interesting because GitHub uh, made Jekyll. And Jekyll is a very powerful, not, not very powerful, but very popular static site generator. And uh, GitHub decided that they wanted to have something more uh, powerful and then they switched to Nanook. And they're, they're really happy with it. Uh, you can just ask them and they'll say that. Uh, Atom is a uh, text editor, a source code editor that's pretty popular. Uh, their documentation also uses Nanoc. And there's a whole bunch more. Uh, the last one that I'm going to show you is the Prometheus website. Prometheus is a monitoring system that was developed at SoundCloud. Uh, it's a really cool monitoring system. You should definitely check it out if you need any kind of metrics collection um, anyway. It's pretty cool. Uh, here is a graph with the total number of available static site generators over time. And um, it starts in 1996, and I think there was, there was ex exactly one. And in 2004, there were three. There was like, there's some written in Perl that no one uses, and like written in C, and, and it, like, anyway, really bizarre things. And then 2007 is when I created Nanoc. Um, that year, actually, there were two more uh, that appeared right after I released it. So I think I, I got the ball rolling. Uh, currently, there's a bit of slowdown. Like people realize that having 450 something or 420 static side generators is more than enough. You really don't need that many. Um, but yeah, so there's, you have quite a choice. Uh, just to give you an idea how different 2007 was, um, GitHub didn't exist at the time. So I, I was developing Nanoc in Subversion, and then I switched to Mercurial. Mercurial felt like the, the next big thing. Uh, it wasn't, it was Git. Um, then I migrated to GitHub in the end. Uh, Obama wasn't president yet, it was still Bush. Uh, SoundCloud didn't exist, Spotify didn't exist. The iPad didn't exist, iPhone didn't exist, Android didn't exist. Um, so very, very different. Um, and so I'm kind of halfway through my talk. So I think it's really high time that I show you my title slide, which is how to build a static site generator. Uh, Denis is my name. You're at the Static Sites Berlin Meetup. Uh, if you're still here, I think you know that. Um, I also wanted to point out that the way you write static site generator is, uh, it needs to be with a hyphen. And because we're talking about generators for static sites, we're not talking about static generators for sites. And if you think that that doesn't really matter, um, please take a look at this headline that talks about students getting um, some first-hand experience on the job, but because there's a hyphen missing, it actually doesn't, look like that, so please, please, please use hyphens. Uh, yeah. Um, second demo, I'm actually not gonna live code this, but if you wanted to create a static site generator, then this is what you could do. So this, this code is written in, in Crystal. Crystal is a language that looks like Ruby. Uh, I wanted something, something else. Um, anyway, so the first thing that you do is you find all the files in a content directory. And so for all those file names, uh, you basically read all those files um, so, and that you, you, you keep track of the file names. So you have the content, the raw content, and the file name. And then all those pages, like all those raw pages, you map. Like for, you, you basically convert them into markdown. So you take the raw content, uh, convert them to markdown. Uh, then you read a file called layout, layout.html. And you can convert every page to that, the content of that layout file, but you replace that strange 
yield with the curly things around it. You replace that with the content uh, of the of the, the markdown, not the markdown, but the raw content that was converted using markdown. And then you basically have the laid out pages. And then for every laid out page, you calculate what should be the output file name, which you get by replacing content with output. Uh, .md, uh, you replace with index.html. And then you create the directory if it doesn't exist yet, and then you write it out. And that's it. Um, that was the quickest static site generator ever written. So as, as an example, if this is your, uh, an about page, for example. Uh, this is your layout page. So this thing will be replaced by the sort of markdown content. So if you compile the site, then you end up with this. And that is a very simple static site generator. It doesn't do much, but that is basically how it works. Um, that is really what my talk was about. Like those 60 seconds. Uh, I think I've wasted your time <laughs> for the rest. Um, but I have more. Uh, you're not getting rid of me yet. Um, why would you write your own static site generator? Well, there's 400 something people that did. Um, but I have honest answers to this question. Um, and I think there's actually five reasons why, I wanna do, why, why you might want to do it. There's also more reasons why you might not want to do it. But if you're learning or like interested in learning how to program, then this is actually a really nice project because it's very, it's very easy and you can make it as complicated as you want. If you want to learn a new programming language, then this is also a good project. Um, if you want to enhance your programming skill, then this is also a good project because you can make it very, very complicated. Uh, that's what I did with Nanoc. And um, it's also useful. At the very least, you can use it to document the static site generator itself, so you can create its own website. That's also what I did with Nanoc, really. And uh, it's very low risk because the only output is HTML files and CSS files, and those files you can put uh, somewhere and no one actually has to run your, your static site generator. So if it, that code isn't running on a, on a web server, so it can be as insecure as you want it to be. Um, so, now you might be thinking, I just showed you how to make a static site generator in 60 seconds, uh, but I've been working on Nanoc for more than 10 years. Like, what the hell am I doing? Um, am, I, am I utterly incompetent? Well, um, I, I don't think so, but that's, that's really not something that I can judge. Um, but there's, there's, a, there's a couple of reasons why I've been working on this for, for, uh, for quite a while. The f there's three reasons. The first, si the first one, well, this is not a full-time job. I haven't been working on this uh, 40 hours a week for the last 10 years. Well, I also have other things to do. So that's the first reason. Uh, the second reason is tooling. And I find that a static site generator itself needs some tooling around it to make it look really, to make it really useful. Uh, so for example, uh, the rules file that I showed you in, in Nanoc is something that, that sort of emerged in a later version. That, uh, that, that turned out to be really useful. Nanoc is also pretty extensible, which you can write your own filters and your own helpers. So you might have seen that I use my own custom markup language for, for the Nanoc website. And I, the way I did this, I wrote a filter for it. I actually want to push that markup language um, to more people. So if, if that looks interesting, please come talk to me. Uh, Nanoc can also pull data from other places. So if you say, if you use Contentful, for example, then you can just pull that data from there. Uh, for uh, the FOSM website, you can use, you can talk to your conference management system, pull all your tracks and speakers and whatever from there. The deploy support, the pre-production check support, like all of that came, came at a later point after uh, the first version of Nanoc was released. But that is what really, I think, really makes Nanoc shine. Um, and the last bit, uh, the last reason why I keep working on Nanoc is, is because it's, I think, really efficient. And then this, uh, this is something that Felix sort of talked about. Um, Nanoc tries to be a very smart static site generator and it will do incremental builds. So that means, um, actually, did I, did, I, did I give you this demo? No, I didn't. I forgot to do a part of my demo. Oh, no. 
Okay, I'm gonna do this now. Uh, something else that I wanna do. Oh no, now I need to go back into split screen. Uh, you can wait a minute. I'm very fast at this. So here we are again. Uh, this is my local website. And uh, so Felix talked about static, static APIs kind of, and that is a really interesting idea. So uh, what I could do is, uh, what, I want, what I want to do is create a sitemap, but in JSON format so that some other part of the site that uses that has some JavaScript can actually read that file. So uh, this is the rules file. I have a sitemap.xml file, uh, but I'll copy that and uh, change that to JSON. I also need uh, a sitemap.json sitemap.json.crb file. And uh, that one should, I think at this point, be written to sitemap.json. Uh, I don't think I have actually the, does that work? Yes, great. Um, so what I want this to do, I actually want to call this, I want to have this call a function called json underscore sitemap, which doesn't exist yet. So I'm going to create one uh, JSON underscore sitemap dot rb, which will contain my my source code, JSON sitemap. Uh, it will just return garbage for now. So if everything goes well, if I refresh this, it just prints garbage. That got that's not JSON. Um, but uh, what I wanted to do is this is large enough, right? Yeah. So I want to take Oops, I want, I want to take all the items of my site and then select the ones that have a title uh, because if it doesn't have a title, it's probably an asset, uh, like an image or something. And oops, I want to take, so that, that those are all the relevant items and for all the relevant items, I kind of want to turn them into uh, uh, like sort of what I, what I want to have out of this is I want the title and I also want the path. And now I have entries. This still returns garbage because actually I'm not turning in, in this into JSON. Uh, but then I can probably have to do like this. And I think it's like there's the, my static thing is running in the background and usually I have notifications up there when a build fails. Uh, something has to fail during live demos, but I, I do know that I am still missing this. Then hopefully, yeah, so this is the output. This is basically a, a JSON file that I, that I generate. Uh, what Nana can also do is for every, uh, every item or like every page can have multiple representations. So you can have like an HTML one, a JSON one, uh, whatever, so uh, doing the whole static API thing is uh, it's pretty easy with Nanook, I think. Now, let's go back to system preferences. Turn my ring off. And continue. So um, the reason why I wanted to give this demo first is because um, so I was talking about efficiency in Nanoc. Nanoc is, an, is a, it, it tries to do incremental builds whenever possible. So that means, so this is the kind of the, the code that I showed you earlier. So if you make a change to a Nanoc item or, or to, to a page in your, in your website, for example, you change some content, then Nanoc will know that it doesn't need to regenerate the sitemap.json because the only things that it looks at is the title and the path. So even if you change, uh, say, the author, if you have like metadata, uh, you, every page has an author, you change the authors, um, then the JSON sitemap will, it will stay the same, of course, but it will not even be recompiled because it doesn't need to. So Nanoc is pretty smart. And uh, like the whole dependency tracking and outdatedness checking is pretty uh, complicated, pretty advanced. Um, if you wanna have a bit more insight in how that works, and it's also documented um, on the internals page. Um, yeah, um, I'm nearing the end of my talk. I hope uh, it was useful so far. I have a couple of takeaways for you. 
Um, the first one is that static site generation is a very valid way of, of generating websites. Um, there's a whole bunch of people and companies that do it. Uh, writing a static site generator is fun and educational and it might soak up 10 years of your life. And uh, I think Nanox is pretty cool, uh, not just because I wrote it, but also because uh, th th there's basically lots of other people that, can, that will tell you the same. Uh, no blackmail involved. Uh, also, hyphenation matters, and please remember that as well. Uh, thank you. Um, interesting. Uh, any question? Uh, uh, thank you very much for the very interesting Nanook. So I want to ask two things. So in the middle of the, your presentation, so you deploying, you, you, uh, you run the, some like, deploying task, right? In the command. So um, I want to see the, how you uh, define the deployment process. And then second, so in the, in the next, so you looks like kind of like um, the browser looks like kind of like each three case where like accent of this. So it, I want to see also the how to define the test also. Uh, yeah, I can do that. Is is my thing still running? Is this working? Can you hear me? Great. Ooh. Uh, yeah. uh, so the the tests are defined in a file called checks. Um, I I should probably run RuboCop on this because it's complaining about everything. I'm sorry. Uh, so for example, like it's you you define a bunch of checks. Um, and then basically you can just like call add issue and it will mm -hmm. just report some kind of error. Uh, you can also define checks that you would specifically want to run for a deploy. So mm -hmm. you, Nano comes with an external links check, mm -hmm. but that's not very... Yeah, yeah, I, I, I can see the screen. Let's check. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, uh, I've, I've been to system preferences quite a bit. Uh, so this is the checks file. It's a, it's a little bit icky because I just dumped things there. It's not the prettiest code, but uh, for instance, uh, what I what I showed you earlier is uh, you basically you define a check and then you call add issue with some message and a subject. It's it's really pretty simple. Um, and then you can define which checks you want to run before deploy. So if these fail, if any of these fail, the deploy will not go through. Uh, as so, that's the first part of your question. Uh, if uh, to define a deployer, so uh, the Nanak website is deployed using Git, mm -hmm. um, and. I'm not actually sure whether this is documented. If it if it isn't, it definitely should be. So you can inherit from this deployer class, and it basically has a method called run, and then you just put your code in there. Mm -hmm. uh, so you could write your own. Uh, Nano comes with rsync, git, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. and fog, which is like this generic badge deployer, but you can you can write your own. Um, yeah. Okay. Super cool. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Thanks, looks super interesting. Um, given that you've done this so long, you, you had this, this slide about uh, the number of, of static site generators yeah. out in the wild. Um, I was wondering, uh, given that static site generators are super powerful um, and efficient because you don't need to render on the server and waste resources. Uh, do, do you by any chance know why they weren't more popular earlier? Like why were there so few in, in the late 90s or early 2000s, if any? Um, that is a question that I've wondered myself. Um, I think the, the hype at the time was PHP and WordPress and uh, dynamic sites and having databases on the server, and that was just a thing that people did. Um, 
it's I think it's just hype. But it's I'm not saying that static sites right now are a hype and it will go over, but like uh, it's something gets gets old and boring. Static sites got old and boring in the late '90s, and uh, people wanted something something else. And it, I, if if someone had written a static site generator in the late late '90s that worked really well, then we'd be doing this for 20 years. That's what I think. Uh, I can add to that um, maybe because there was no mobile devices and requirement actually was not uh, you need like a super fast uh, website to run in your mobile and so on so most of the people were using desktops mm. and yeah maybe they didn't see the requirement there but none of his wrist has existed before the iPhone so yeah that's <laughs> great <laughs> Yeah. Any any other questions? Yes. Um, uh, you can also find me later. Um, not saying I'm not saying shut up, but like, <laughs> I will be around. You can ask me questions later as well. Um, you said that the the um, how do you say this? The incremental builds that they are documented somewhere, but. Can you like briefly outline how that would work technically, and does it work between deployments or only be like during the watch process? Uh, it works. Uh, so Nanoc, well, after you run a compilation, it will store. It will remember which items depend on which other items. By item, I mean a page or an asset or whatever it is any, any kind of any kind of file, um, and it will even track. Uh, the kind of dependency is it does it depend on the raw content on the compiled content does it depend on attributes in which case which attributes and so on and so forth um, it uh, so it stores an de dependency graph which will load into memory or uh, because it's pretty small like it was loaded into memory the next time so uh, it will also uh, with some kind of checksumming figure out what pages have changed uh, if they have changed, is it just the content or is it just the attributes uh, or is it both or whatever? And then using those two bits of information, they can actually de determine uh, what the, the total set of all pages that need to be need to be recompiled. Um, and there's also like sometimes it will. Uh, so one page that is outdated might use the compiled content of another page which isn't outdated. And then it will refer to the cache, so uh, it's that makes it pretty pretty quick. That's a very very short explanation. Yeah. So I have uh, one more question. Uh, so you showed this rules file. Yeah. Um, can you combine multiple rules file, or is it just one file with all the rules in it? Um, so what you can do, so you can have multiple rules file, but um, what you can also do is, uh, it, there are Ruby files, so you can um, uh, make it a bit shorter. You can extract some pieces of code into um, a separate file and so on. So, yes. Okay, I guess I have another question. So, um, querying the data, like, um, how much data is available, uh, like in any page uh, you're rendering, uh, and so on? Do uh, you have all the data uh, in one thing, and then you query it, or how's yeah. it done? Yeah. So on any page, you can you can basically query all of the items, all of the pages that exist, filter them, do something with them. Um, yeah. So basically, the entire data model is available. Um, it's mostly in memory, uh, which for very large sites can be a problem, and this is something I'm actively working on. Uh, but there have been people that create nano sites with more than a million pages, I think, like millions of pages, which I wouldn't do personally, but people do it. Um, but yeah, this is like this is one point of improvement, but it's really yeah. And how do you query that? Is like normal Ruby syntax or yeah? So what I what I showed earlier, which is the uh, basically, uh, this this is not what I wanted to show, but 
what was it? Like this kind of thing. Like this is how you would item just has all the items in there, and uh, we could, we also have layouts. Item is the current the current page. Uh, config and talk, get the configuration and so on. Uh, you can also do it there okay. from anywhere. What kind of syntax is that then? It's all it's all Ruby. So, but the the the, the template or the, the layout would have to be like ERB or Haml oh. and so on. Yeah. 